In September 1920, British Prime Minister David Lloyd George wrote a letter to his family in Wales, describing Ireland as a hell's broth. And that broth was getting hotter by the day. The British government had woefully underestimated the strength of public support for the Irish Republican cause, and it had hardened with the creation of two martyrs. Terence McSweeney, Sinn Féin's Lord Mayor of Cork and Commandant of the IRA's 1st Cork Brigade, died on the 74th day of his hunger strike in Brixton Prison. And a week later, Kevin Barry was hanged in Mountjoy Jail, the first such execution since the 1916 Rising. Just a lad of 18 summers. The ballad of Kevin Barry, which helped to turn his hanging into valuable IRA propaganda made much of his youth. But there was no sign that Lloyd George saw it as an own goal when a few days later he rose here in London's Guild Hall to make a bombastic speech in which he claimed that the government had murder by the throat. In fact, the bloodiest eight months of the conflict lay immediately ahead. Perhaps a period that was necessary to convince each side that military victory was not achievable at acceptable cost. It had been widely expected that Kevin Barry's death sentence would be commuted, that the British authorities would surely not dare to execute an 18-year-old medical student. But hawks like Winston Churchill, then Britain's Secretary of State for War, wanted to see IRA murderers dangling from ropes. Roy, how good to see you. Good to see you. How are you? Such a pleasure. And we meet in the very place where Lloyd George made his very bombastic speech in November of 1920. Now, I was thinking it was a kind of rather bloodthirsty thing, but looking back through the files, it was as though the government was in quite a bloodthirsty frame of mind. Uh, this is Tom Jones's uh, diary. Uh, Churchill remarked that it was monstrous that we have some 200 murders and no one hung. Uh, at one point in the meeting, Churchill stated, you agreed six or seven months ago that there should be hangings, a sentiment obviously directed at the Prime Minister, to which the Prime Minister Lloyd George responded, I'm certain that you must hang. Well, Lloyd George was reluctant to hang, partly because he was that sort of man, and partly because he had a certain sympathy with Ireland. One of its principles is the defence of small nations. Wales have been the first, the Boers after that, and therefore the small nation, as represented by Ireland, he felt he was instinctively on their side. But Life was made impossible for him by the way that the Irish nationalists were behaving. I mean, they were arbitrarily shooting policemen, public servants, weren't being caught, uh, and therefore the pressure to retaliate was overwhelming. To the particular case of Kevin Barry, General McCready, who signs his death warrant, writes to Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson, I hope nothing is going wrong about the man Barry who murdered the soldiers the other day and has been condemned to death and will be hung on Monday. I imagine there must be some game on to get a reprieve and all I have to say is that if they do such a thing it will irritate the troops to a very great extent because here is a clean cut case of murder without any doubt. I think the facts of that are irrefutable. When Barry is leading a group of vigilantes, attacks gratuitously with British soldiers, uh, is caught by mistake under a lorry, um, and was subject to normal judicial proceedings. He was tried. So whilst I'm a bitter opponent of capital punishment, I understand why in 1920 it was thought the appropriate action to take against Barry. The IRA later, not least in the ballad, made much of uh, Barry's use. Uh, it actually turns out that Private Washington, whom he had shot, uh, was less than 16. Yes. Well, Barry was a sports player of Irish games. He was an undergraduate reading medicine. He was a handsome young man. He was ideal for that position of martyr for the Irish cause. Of course, the IRA would have said, 
that both sides were murdering all the time uh, and that uh, if the IRA took prisoners, they weren't in the habit of hanging them. Well, the IRA weren't taking prisoners and hanging them. They were just assassinating people in the streets. I mean, I'm on the Republican side. I'm, I'm a Sinn Féiner by nature. But they did commit atrocities which by normal standard would be regarded as murder. Um, this, to me, is a wonderful document. This is uh, Lloyd George on 10 Downing Street paper um, trying to work out what he's going to say in the Guildhall speech. Here, suddenly, he's talking about uh, Mesopotamia. And then we have murder by the throat in Ireland. He actually believed when he made the speech that he was going to have peace in Ireland imposed on them by force. Uh, that didn't work, so he thought that a truce and a negotiated peace was the alternative. But it just shows Lloyd George doing anything to get rid of problems. Don't worry me about the principles. I'll shoot you to do it if necessary. I'll talk to you if necessary, which is exactly what he did. Even the doves in Dublin Castle had been predicting the demise of the IRA. But in the same month that Lloyd George made his hawkish speech at London's Guild Hall in November 1920, the British suffered twin military disasters. First came Bloody Sunday, and then, just a week later, a deadly ambush in County Cork that ended talk of having murder by the throat. Since their arrival in West Cork, the auxiliaries had countered the IRA with aggressive raids and arrests. But C Company, based at McCroom Castle, let its guard down and repeatedly used the same roads returning from patrol, passing through the townland of Kilmichael every day. On November the 28th, 1920, an IRA ambush party lay in wait. In a close-range firefight, 17 of the 18-strong auxiliary patrol were killed. The ambush on that cold and damp November day shook Lloyd George. According to his private secretary, Tom Jones, he told the cabinet that it had been of a different character to previous assassinations. This was a military operation, and there was a good deal to be said for declaring martial law in that corner of Ireland. And here is the proclamation that soon followed. It was now hard to deny that Britain was at war, but its continued reliance on police forces, however unconventional, failed to recognize that reality. From the opening shots of this war of independence, the fighting in Cork had been particularly bloody. Narrow, tightly packed streets were perfect for insurgency. But revenge was in the air, and on December the 11th, 1920, Crown forces retaliated for this latest IRA outrage by setting the city alight. Even before the burning of Patrick Street down here below me, the Army Commander-in-Chief Neville McCready had written, General Strickland will need to watch the police very carefully his RIC district commander certainly would think that martial law means that he can kill anybody he sees walking down the road. The British had imposed martial law without military discipline, and the torching of Cork, captured on newsreel to be seen all round the world, was a public relations disaster. The burning of Cork Merciless reprisals brought Britain a stream of bad publicity, not just at home, but throughout the empire, across Europe, and crucially, in the United States. As the chorus of condemnation of British actions in Ireland grew ever louder, the government brought in its early version of a spin doctor. There's been a fortress here since before Viking times, and over the centuries its battlements have bristled with artillery. Had the War of Independence been determined by force of arms alone, the British would have won with superior numbers and equipment. But in an insurgency, it's the battles for hearts and minds and to establish legitimacy that count. Here at the heart of British rule, 
The typewriter was the weapon of necessity as the government fought and lost a war of propaganda. The man sent to head the British propaganda unit in Dublin Castle was Basil Clark, an esteemed former war correspondent. His department pumped out deliberately misleading stories, propaganda by news, with Clark insisting that every story contained an air of truth. Here I've got a, an organisation diagram our Basil Clark at the mm. top. This is the organisation for collecting of news from the RIC and Auxiliary Division. Things like journalists who are making visits to companies, uh, extracts from RIC reports to be collated and possibly used for propaganda. Not much wrong with that, is there? No, and I think what that reflects is that, is that Basil Clark's office worked pretty well with uh, the, the RIC, that the personal relationships were, were, were good. Clark, um, his, his overall sense of propaganda was that you, you need to establish Dublin Castle as, as, a, as a credible, truthful source of information, and then you can start to manipulate the public opinion through the selection of which facts you, uh, you distribute and which facts you, you don't. But, but the RIC, um, their approach to propaganda was, was to, 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 to lie and lie and lie again. For example, when, when the British executed Kevin Barry, they, uh, they, they tried to place a newspaper article about a medium who'd been contacted by Barry from beyond the grave and, and said that heaven had melted his wicked heart and, that, and, and, and calling on Irish people to lay down their, their, their arms, which came, I think, from, from the RIC's view of the Irish as, in, in a sort of xenophobic way that didn't take them seriously. They also faked the Sinn Féin newspaper, the Irish Bulletin, that nobody would have, would have thought was, was a real uh, Sinn Féin document and ended up being, being lambasted in, in Parliament. They, they even went to the extreme of faking a battle called the Battle of Tralee, which, which never happened, which again en en ended up with, with, with egg on, uh, on the British face. It sounds like a nightmare for Basil Clark, but he gets the blame. This letter from General McCready says, until this question of propaganda is properly tackled, by someone far more able than Basil Clark, we shall never get it right. Why is he getting the blame? So MacReady saw propaganda purely through the eyes of, of, of the impact on soldiers' morale. He gave an infamous interview to the Associated Press where he was talking about the reprisals and, and essentially said, who can blame the soldiers for going rioting through uh, Irish towns? Uh, and the idea that you would give a journalist that, that interview is, is, is just... You, you cannot get your head around why he thought that was a good idea. Did Basil Clark never fib? Basil Clark is, is seen um, in many, many circles as, as the, a liar, and there is no real evidence for that. And I think that the, the sad thing for him was that while, while, of course, he was trying to paint the British in the, in the best light, um, there's no evidence that he, he actually made up things himself. But he put out a lot of false statements because a lot of the reports that came in um, were, were based, on, based on lies. The events of Bloody Sunday and the Kill Michael ambush that followed had changed the mood and emboldened the doves, both in Dublin Castle and in Cabinet. Perhaps it was time to talk to their Irish tormentors. Little did they know that the Prime Minister had been making overtures to the enemy throughout the bloody summer of 1920. During Britain's four years of bitter struggle on the Western Front, Lloyd George had grown accustomed to the General's bravado and over-optimism. He discounted it now. He sanctioned secret meetings with Sinn Féin to sound out the possibility of a deal. 75 years later, another Prime Minister, John Major, would follow a similar path. State documents tell the story of those tentative first approaches and reveal how a Sinn Féin envoy, with the help of an American journalist, was secretly meeting an official from the Foreign Office's Political Intelligence Department. I'm looking here at uh, the beginning of the diplomatic process between the British government and Sinn Féin. And this is testimony from a man called Patrick Moylet, 
who was an intermediary. My first interview took place at the Foreign Office, where we are now, where I met Phillips and then Fisher, who was chairman of the Cabinet Committee of Ireland and Minister for Education in England at the time. Phillips had been secretary to Asquith when he was prime minister and afterwards secretary to Lloyd George. So when do you think it first occurs to Lloyd George that something else is required, that is to say negotiation? Well, the official that... that uh we're dealing with here, who deals with Patrick Moyle, is a man called C.J. Phillips. Now, Phillips gives an interview in April to an American journalist called Carl Ackerman, and he tells him, in three years' time, Ireland will be a republic in all but name, there will be no British soldiers there, uh, and they will have control of their own army and navy. So, quite clearly, they all know that something other than a souped-up home rule settlement is gone and something more has to be delivered. Not a republic, always not a republic in name only, because that is too much of a humiliation for the British Empire. But more or less anything short of that will be acceptable. But why Moylet's so important is he represents Arthur Griffith, and Griffith is already clear in his mind that there's no point in even arguing for a republic. And the left wing of Sinn Féin, as he puts it, will just have to put up with that. During this time, the dirty war continues on both sides. Large-scale killings, reprisals by the British forces. To what extent do they affect the discussions? Well, the remarkable thing is that really they don't for a variety of reasons. One is once you've made this political decision, which is uncomfortable for British politicians, they don't like to admit to themselves what they're doing. And Sargent says this in the diary, what we're doing here, we can't fully admit to ourselves. And we certainly can't admit in public. But once you've made the decision, that's what you're doing. You're not fighting a military campaign to suppress the IRA. We're out here to find somebody on their side who knows what the line of compromise is, knows that the British Empire can't be humiliated here. We have just, after all, beaten the Germans. So we're not going to accept defeat at the hands of the IRA. But equally, we know we can't win without using methods that British public opinion regards as abhorrent. Now, that means a compromise. I was on the Northern Ireland Committee in the 1990s when the Conservative government first began to speak to Sinn Féin. You observed closely the Good Friday Agreement that followed. How should we compare the events of the 1920s with those of the 1990s? Well, we have a problem in the way that we think about politics now, which is we tend to think about human rights and the fulfilment of human rights. Actually, what happens in the 90s and in the 80s in terms of the handling of Sinn Féin and the IRA looks very like 1921, mounting in certain cases to assassination or or something close to state-sponsored assassination. And on the other hand, always say, oh, terribly sorry, but that friend of yours killed last week. But you know, if we had a dialogue, you'd be quite amazed how flexible we could be. And it's this combination of dirty war plus dialogue, which actually pretty looks, history doesn't repeat itself, but there is a remarkable similarity about the two and the way the thing came to an end. By the end of 1920, British coercion was eased by the prospect of negotiation. Sir John Anderson, the Under Secretary for Ireland, one of the new breed ushered into Dublin Castle after the summer clear out, described Lloyd George's new policy as cracking the whip with one hand and holding out the carrot in the other. The intention was to wage uncompromising war on the gunmen, but at the same time, to encourage the peacemakers. The imposition of martial law in Southwest Ireland as a reaction to the slaughter at Kilmichael was postponed until the 10th of December, 1920. In the interval, Lloyd George, with the permission of the majority of his cabinet, asked the visiting Catholic Archbishop of Perth in Australia to explore the possibility of an immediate truce. Archbishop Clune stayed here at Ardennen, the home of the O'Connell family, under an alias, and set about meeting Sinn Féin leaders, asking that, as he went about the government's business, he should not be inadvertently killed by the Black and Tans. Archbishop Clune visited the Prime Minister in London 
and described the brutality of British reprisals in his native County Clare. Lloyd George professed to be shocked and asked the Archbishop whether, depending on Cabinet approval, he might act as a mediator in talks with Sinn Féin. Despite objections from a number of hardliners, Lloyd George got his way and Clune was sent to Dublin to talk with Michael Collins and other Republican leaders. All right. Ah, Michael, nice to meet you. What a pleasure to see you in this historic house. Yeah, it's a fabulous setting. Archbishop Clune actually had a family connection with part of the slaughter, didn't he? Yes, Archbishop Clune's nephew uh, was a man called Connor Clune. Now, he was in Dublin at the time of the Bloody Sunday uh, events. And that evening, he is being held prisoner along with a number of IRA men in uh, Dublin Castle. Now, he has absolutely no involvement with the Sinn Féin political party. He is solely an Irish language activist. And he's actually mistaken for an IRA man there, a guy called Sean Fitzpatrick. They're both of similar build, and a number of the auxiliaries in Black and Tans are actually drunk. They mistake one for the other, and they kill Connor Clune, a totally innocent man. Here's an extract from Tom Jones's diary on the 13th of December, 1920. Uh, the uh, Prime Minister apparently has said, the one thing that I kept impressing on the Archbishop was that the Sinn Féin leaders must give up the idea of getting their aims by violence. Was that a realistic thing to ask for? Well, at the time, Michael Collins had actually written to Arthur Griffith, who was one of the leaders of Sinn Féin, who was in prison, and said, look, if the British are willing to offer us an honourable truce, it is something that I feel would benefit the cause, the movement, and the, the IRA. The problem is that when the negotiations take place, the British are issuing very hard um, kind of conditions to that truce. A number of the conditions for the talks are set out here. All arms, ammunition, uniforms, explosives in areas under martial law to be surrendered to the government. Was that a realistic condition? No, absolutely not. The IRA at the time were very clear that they were not going to surrender arms. The Archbishop at the time challenged Lloyd George and he said, when you agreed an armistice with the Germans at the end of the Great War, you didn't make them lay down arms. Some of the other conditions imposed as well is that if Dáil Éireann, the Irish rebel government was meeting that only certain members could meet. They don't want to let Richard Mulcahy or Michael Collins meet because they're members of the IRA. And when the rebel government, Dáil Éireann, meets, they want them to announce a ceasefire by the IRA. And the British, of course, will keep the military status. They will hang on to their guns, they will still keep patrolling. And as part of these truce conditions, the British also want the right to keep on executing prisoners who've been court-martialed. So really, if you have an army that's agreeing to lay down its arms, that's agreeing to a ceasefire that's not being met by their opponent, and that is going to see some of their prisoners actually executed even after the, the ceasefire, that is a surrender. The negotiations break down. Monsignor McMahon reports that his grace conveyed to the Prime Minister through his secretary that he believed the Cabinet would yet regret their decision in not accepting his terms. He warned them that they were living in a fool's paradise in hoping that they would crush the people and frighten them. Was it a big missed opportunity? It was a huge missed opportunity. The Archbishop's peace manoeuvre, there were a number of them at the time, but the Archbishop's one was the only one that had a realistic chance of success. It was the only one that Michael Collins, the leader of the IRA, that Arthur Griffith, the, one of the leaders of Sinn Féin, were, were involved in. And the real tragedy of this is that half of the casualties in the Irish War of Independence happen in the six months between this failed peace initiative and the truce that is agreed in July of 1921. We're talking about 1,000 lives lost that could have been saved if the British hadn't been as intransigent and if peace could have been agreed earlier in uh, December of 1920. Archbishop Clune's efforts had failed. The British military's top brass was still convinced that it was only a matter of time before they would crush the IRA. In December 1920, the generals promised the British cabinet that they would secure victory in the spring. The amused looking black and tans and auxiliaries who survived an attack on their quarters here at the London Northwestern Hotel might have been laughing at that assessment. There had been no knockout blow. 
Lloyd George's peace feelers had not produced results, and Bona Law, the leader of the Conservatives in his coalition, still urged coercion, not dialogue. Meanwhile, the British campaign of counter-terror continued, spearheaded by the Black and Tans and auxiliaries, committing government-authorised reprisals. In late February 1921, Crown forces even managed a rare military success after learning that members of the 4th Battalion of the IRA 1st Corps Brigade had decamped to an isolated thatched house about a mile from the village of Clonmelt, a detail of the 2nd Battalion Hampshire Regiment under the command of Lieutenant A.R. Coe surrounded the house. Two of the IRA volunteers were shot dead in a firefight while the others took shelter inside the house. A siege began. Four of the volunteers tried to escape. One got away, the other three were killed. British reinforcements arrived. Petrol was doused on the thatched roof and set alight. With the farmhouse burning around them, the remaining IRA volunteers surrendered. The Clubmont ambush became infamous for what happened next. The officer commanding the British forces, Lieutenant Coe, wrote this report. At 1830, six or seven rebels came out with their hands up. On this, fire was again opened by the remaining rebels in the house. It was inevitable that casualties should be inflicted on the rebels outside by both sides. This British version was contradicted by the IRA and widely disbelieved by the Irish public, more willing to suspect British treachery. The casualty count in Clonmelt was 14 IRA dead, two black and tans killed, and five subsequent executions of suspected informers by the IRA. The ambush was the outstanding British victory of the campaign, but it certainly didn't change the course of the war. If anyone in the British government still believed that the IRA could be crushed or peace be achieved without negotiation, the events of the 13th to 15th of May 1921 were a blow. Coinciding with elections to the Home Rule Parliament in which Sinn Féin swept the board, 15 soldiers and policemen were slaughtered in a two-day spree. There were killings in Dublin, Castle Townbear, and Tipperary. And here at Ballyturin House near Gort in County Galway, ambushing a single car, the IRA killed two army officers and an RIC district inspector along with his wife. When police reinforcements arrived, a constable was fatally wounded, bringing the death toll to five. With no end to the killing in sight, Lloyd George and his cabinet weighed up the wisdom of holding parliamentary elections in Ireland, North and South, under the Government of Ireland Act. Unionist leader Sir Edward Carson argued that postponing those elections would convince Sinn Féin that its murder campaign could kill off the Act. And Lloyd George was in no mood to antagonise Carson. The Whitson massacres were a reminder that the military strategy had not succeeded, not yet anyway. And in the elections to the Southern Parliament, Sinn Féiners took 124 seats unopposed, accounting for all but four. If it could be argued that the war was still in the balance, the elections represented a political route that was unambiguous. In 124, Sinn Féiners returned to the Southern Irish Parliament, refusing to take their seats, forming a second Doyle, a pretty good political crisis for the British. But something that they would have expected, because Sinn Féin had opposed partition and had ignored the machinations of Westminster, from which they abstained from 1919. 
So, in many ways, the British government had conceived, I think, of the 1920 Act, the Government of Ireland Act, not as an act to bring in limited, devolved parliaments in both parts of Ireland, though that's what the Act stipulated. But really, it was a genuine attempt to solve the Ulster question on terms acceptable to Craig and the Ulster Unionists. So everything was about the North. And then it refers to, dismissively almost, the other 26 counties. One other compelling piece of evidence comes from Lord Birkenhead, the Lord Chancellor, and a dyed-in-the-wool Carsonite, who said he was only agreeing to the concept of a Southern Irish Parliament because he believed Sinn Féin would never accept it. There are elections to the Parliament in the South and the North at about the same time. What is the result in the North? The North was a, an overwhelmingly unionist victory. You'll see in the state papers from the, the cabinet room, constant references to James Craig feels there'll be no problem about establishing Northern Ireland. The Northern Nationalist leader, who was a lone voice on the House of Commons, Joe Devlin, said they will establish their parliament for the six counties, the worst form of partition, because it had an executive in Belfast, which was unionist controlled, with the nationalists as a permanent minority. So Craig has been consulted along the way, and he wins 40 of the 52 seats, with Sinn Féin and the Constitutional Nationalists abstaining against partition. It seems there's a change of opinion from Churchill. Uh, it's of great public importance to get a respite in Ireland. I don't agree that it would be a sign of weakness. What's going on, he says, is uh, getting us an odious reputation poisoning our relations with the United States. It is in our power to go on and enlist constables and black and tans, but we should do everything to get away to a settlement. The fact that the reprisal policy, which had been winked at by Lord George Churchill um, and many others, um, is failing. It's totally counterproductive. They can't continue that because of world opinion, because of the critique, for example, of the British Labour Party, who have a damning indictment in their report in Ireland in 1920, uh, but the Church of England condemning the activities of the, the Black and Tans. And, of course, by 1921, with fresh elections reinforcing the Sinn Féin mandate, with Sinn Féin courts replacing the Crown Courts over much of Ireland, with county councils declaring their allegiance to the Doyle that met here, a Republican institution. It was impossible for Britain to assuage American public opinion. And at this time, a British diplomat reported from Washington that anti-British feeling in Irish America was like fizz in a soda bottle. And that's a key concentrator of British minds as we approach the negotiations in 1921. The British cabinet was preparing to intensify the war threatening martial law throughout the 26 counties if, as was inevitable, the Southern Parliament didn't function. But in Dublin Castle, the Doves were readying for peace. In May 1921, the Under Secretary for Ireland, Sir John Anderson, sent word to a Sinn Féin middleman, Patrick Moylet, that the British wanted to meet Eamon de Valera. The splendid Shelbourne Hotel Dublin. It owes its place in Republican history, not to its finery, though there is indeed plenty of that, but rather to the gentleman's lavatory, where Moylet was introduced to British intermediary Colonel Brind. And the next day he met senior civil servant Andy Cope and claims that he told him, we're willing to admit but we are defeated. We're willing to withdraw our whole establishment from the lowest policeman to the highest judge. I very much doubt that. But it wasn't a bad summary of where we would end up. There was one crucial piece of business that needed to be concluded before this war could finally be halted. The copper fastening of Northern Ireland. And on the 22nd of June 1921, the King was in Belfast, formally to open the first session of the new Parliament there. It proved to be a critical moment. The conflict in Ireland was ostensibly between rebels and the British Crown. 
But the man who wore it, King George V, was distressed that his subjects were murdering each other and disturbed that his government was pursuing an unacknowledged policy of reprisals, a sentiment widely shared throughout the empire. When he was invited to inaugurate the new Northern Ireland Parliament here in Belfast City Hall, the King saw an opportunity and was urged by the Prime Minister of South Africa, General Jan Smuts, to proclaim a message of conciliation. Marie, hello. Michael, pleased to meet you. Great to see you. And, uh, well, we meet in the very chamber where, on the 22nd of June, 1921, His Majesty King George V inaugurated the Parliament of Northern Ireland. Here, recorded by Edward Grigg, uh, this is uh, Lloyd George's private secretary, uh, is um, a conversation that he's had with the King's private secretary. And this says that the King was greatly concerned about the speech from the throne that he'll deliver here, particularly anxious that you should consider some suggestions in regard to it, which we've made to him by General Smuts. General Smuts had apparently seized the opportunity it was being received by the King to express his feelings on the subject. And uh, Grigg seems to approve of what's being suggested. Whether the appeal succeeds or not in Green Ireland, the King's speech presents an opportunity which will not come again of putting us British right with the English-speaking world. This reflects, I think, then, um, the King's embarrassment about his government's policy. Yes, very much so. The King had been hearing reports about atrocities like the burning of Balbriggan, uh, other atta- other uh, assaults by the Black and Hands on civilians and on property, and he was very, very unhappy at what was being done in his name. The very fact that he was prepared to come over and open this regional parliament, which he had not done in any of the other dominions, that's very symbolic of the King's interest in Ireland and of using the opportunity to see what he could do, how the authority of his role could be brought to finding a resolution. The suggestion which has come from uh, General Smuts of um, a conciliatory message obviously commends itself to Edward Grigg. He says, I'm much impressed by General Smuts' view because he has great insight into political situations. At this time, the Imperial Conference was taking place. So all of the Dominion Prime Ministers, Smuts, uh, Massey from New Zealand, Hughes from Australia, were all in London. So Smuts had an opportunity to make his his voice known. Smuts had been a a Boer commando during the Second Boer War, fighting a guerrilla war against the British in South Africa. He understood the Irish situation, the military situation in Ireland quite well. But there's a whole other side about Smuts that's uh, important, and it's the way in which the Irish had been lobbying Smuts prior to his arrival at the Imperial Conference to bring some pressure on the British. So what you're seeing playing out in London in June of 1921 is the successful effects of the Dáil revolutionary foreign policy also. Smuts appears to be largely successful because when the King comes here, He says uh, lots of conciliatory things. My memories of the Irish people date back to the time when I spent many happy days in Ireland as a midshipman. My affection for the Irish people has been deepened by the successive visits since that time, and I have watched with constant sympathy the course of their affairs. And now here really is the cracking paragraph. I appeal to all Irishmen to pause to stretch out the hand of forbearance and conciliation, to forgive and to forget, and to join in making for the land which they love a new era of peace, contentment, and goodwill. I never saw a speech by a monarch that was so full of content as that. Yes, I I agree. I think you expect the usual platitudes and uh, not doing anything that could be seen as, as in any way political, whereas that is a very direct appeal to de Valera and to Irish Republicans. If that came from Lloyd George, the Irish would be uh, understandably a bit more wary. The king is above politics, so we should see the king's invitation and this renewed effort to uh, resolve the situation coming in the wider context of of a a longer running effort to bring some sort of conclusion to what was happening in Ireland. 
Well, it seems to me that at last the British government is getting its uh, peace act together because just two days after the King's speech, uh, Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, writes to Eamon de Valera, the British government are deeply anxious that, so far as they can assure it, the King's appeal for reconciliation in Ireland shall not have been made in vain. Goes on to invite de Valera to a conference which will be attended by Sir James Craig, now the Premier of Northern Ireland, and that you should bring with you for the purpose any colleagues who you may select. And I love this. This is from <laughs> the Prime Minister to de Valera. I am, sir, your obedient servant, David Lloyd George. So, a real effort now mm -hmm. to get the peace. Yes, I think so, but the situation is still very much up in the air. On that very day that that letter was sent, the 24th of June, a, a troop train carrying British soldiers back from the opening of the Parliament for, in Belfast to Dublin was derailed by the IRA between Newry and Dundalk and four soldiers were killed. So there were still some very delicate negotiations to be undertaken. It's a very open-ended invitation. It's not imposing any uh, preconditions on negotiations. So I think there's, uh, it, it, it hits the right tone and it needs to hit that tone because the, the violence is still quite intense in Ireland at that period, in this period. The Northern Ireland Parliament was up and running and the King's speech had changed the mood. Lloyd George saw his opportunity and eventually, with more help from General Smuts, the British Prime Minister and the President of the Doyle Aaron, Eamon de Valera, agreed to meet face to face. In order to bring the killing to an end, it's necessary for each side to sit down with its mortal enemy and talk, having vowed many times never to do so. I'm going to speak now with a man who can tell me from the British government side how that point is reached, drawing on his experience of bringing the recent troubles to a truce. Even a hundred years later, these documents might be regarded by some in Ireland as the enemy files. When you first sat down with Sinn Féin IRA, did you think of them as the enemy? Absolutely. IRA had shot and injured my father during the Second World War. The, uh, my brother, who worked for Mrs. Thatcher, had been on their death list for eight years. I just spent uh, two years in Washington trying to stop Jerry Adams getting a visa to go to the United States. So when we first met them, we insisted we meet them in a room with no windows so they couldn't be filmed through the windows. And Alistair Campbell and I refused to shake hands with Adams and McGuinness. Tony Blair, much more sensibly, did shake hands. But no, they were very much the enemy for me. And is it conceivable then that they thought they were shaking a hand that had blood on it. Absolutely. We were the enemy for them as they were the enemy for us. So what sort of conditions is it that brings two enemies to sit down together? I think it's, it's a phrase the academics have, which is a mutually hurting stalemate. So it's that sort of stage when you know you're not going to win, you know you're not going to be defeated, this could go on forever. What you describe sounds pretty like the situation I've encountered in these files. 1919 to 22. Had you studied that history before you sat down with Sinn Féin IRA? No, I'm afraid to say I was really pretty ignorant about the history, as was Tony Blair when we started the negotiations. If we had actually known how much history was freighted into this, we might never have tried to resolve Northern Ireland. But luckily, the, uh, the blessing of ignorance allowed us to try. Some of your first meetings must have been in secret. Yes, I remember getting a call um, from Martin McGuinness rather unexpectedly. And he said, would I come and meet him in Derry incognito and not tell the securocrats. Uh, I was a bit sort of taken aback, but I went and asked Tony Blair and he said, yes, go and meet with them. Uh, so I took a plane to Belfast International, a taxi to Derry, and I stood on a street corner feeling very foolish with a folded up copy of the FT under my arm. And two guys with shaved heads turned up and they pushed me into the back of this taxi and drove me around the town for an hour until I was completely lost and then pushed me out of the, the, the vehicle. I was in a modern house on the edge of an estate and I knocked on the door and Martin McGuinness came to the door on crutches and made an unfunny joke about kneecapping. And then we spent three hours together in the living room. Uh, the lady of the house had gone away and left some sandwiches and a fire in the grate. We made no breakthroughs at all, but it came home to me that if you're going to succeed in a negotiation like this, you need to win trust by going onto their turf, not insisting they come to Stormont or Downing Street. One of your ancestors in the role was a man called Andy Cope. Uh, and I have an impression that uh, Andy 
found it rather thrilling. He liked the cloak and dagger stuff. Uh, you know, he, he'd been a customs inspector. Yes, it certainly is a lot more interesting than sitting at your desk and working on a computer, that's for sure. But I wasn't quite as adventurous as Andy Cope. He really had the trust of Lloyd George to go out and do these things and override the officials. That bit I guess I could relate to, because Northern Ireland secretaries aren't always necessarily happy that someone from Number 10 is floating around trying to uh, talk to people surreptitiously when they're trying to hold the line on the public position of um, using force. But he was obviously a remarkable person. As I was going through these files, you, you, you know that it's going to end up with a truce. I'm kind of thinking, get on with it, get to that place. But actually, it only took them three years. Now, you could say that it took us, uh, the government I was part of, or the government that you helped, more like 30 years. Why did it take so long? The reason is really you're building trust. People don't trust each other, even when they've signed an agreement. You've got a long process to go through. And I think the same was true in the negotiations leading up to the treaty. They had to get enough trust from the Irish. This was a serious negotiation. Uh, and the British themselves had to resolve the debates within uh, their own policy, some of whom didn't want a settlement at all. On the 9th of July, 1921, the Jonathan Powell of his day, Andy Cope, joined General McCready at a meeting in the Mansion House to thrash out the terms of a truce with the Sinn Féin leadership. It came into effect two days later, at noon, on the 11th of July, 1921. The war was over, and the truce paved the way for the negotiations that led to the Anglo-Irish Treaty and the formation of the Irish Free State. The Republican Revolution, and what became known as the War of Independence, caused power to change hands in a way not seen on the island of Ireland since the 17th century. Would Lloyd George's Tory-dominated government have moved so far beyond the narrow confines of the old Home Rule Act if not for the violent intervention of the IRA? And was the only means of securing Irish independence to spill blood? I feel a sense of awe, even of unreality, that as a former Minister of the Crown, I'm about to enter the chamber of the Doyle Aaron. This Parliament is an expression of the Irish people's will. It is founded on pillars of courage and bloodshed, as most democratic assemblies are. And as a former parliamentarian, I feel the greatest respect for it. Fighting an insurgency is never easy, particularly when in successive elections, the public proclaims its support for the rebels. Even so, Britain put itself at an unnecessary disadvantage with a semi-official policy of reprisals that cost its support at home and abroad. Even before the war began, Britain had conceded Irish home rule. And after all the killing, Ireland obtained not independence, but dominion home rule and recognition of the dial. Could that advance have been achieved peacefully? The British certainly appeared obdurate. But in fact, the Hawks' main objective was to protect the Ulster Unionists, which was achieved through partition. The question, was the war necessary and worth it, is poignant because Ireland went on to fight a civil war, something it's less keen to remember now than its war of independence. <laughs> 